And here to introduce our speaker is Heather Sullivan Catlin. She is a professor of sociology at SUNY Potsdam University. Come on up, Professor. There she is. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to echo Kate's thanks there at the end. Um, I'm delighted to introduce the last, but definitely not the least, featured speaker of this incredible conference. I first had the pleasure of introducing Kristen at a different kind of conference, the Garden Share Food Day Youth Summit, where the audience was about 200 middle and high school students and their teachers, not unlike the many Adirondack Youth Climate Summits that she's also keynoted and that you heard about earlier today from Kurt Steger and Jen Kretzer uh, at the Wild Center. Here's what I said back in 2011. In, in 2003, Mark and Kristen Kimball started Essex Farm in Essex, New York with a seemingly impossible goal to provide 100 local residents with every one of their ingredient needs. After a grueling first year, the Kimballs were producing beef, pork, chicken, eggs, milk, cheese, vegetables, herbs, fruits, grain, flour, dried beans, lard, and maple syrup. In her recent book, The Dirty Life, Kristen tells the story of launching the farm and describes the ups and downs of their work. They now provide 150 members with a year-round diet. This is still from my 11 years old uh, introduction. I went on, uh, picking up another thread from this conference. In his book, Deep Economy, one of the most influential environmental leaders of our time and North Country native, Bill McKibben, described his attempt to eat only local foods for a full year. His effort included membership in the Kimball's Essex Farm, about which he said, quote, except for paper towels and dental floss, you'd never have to set foot in the store again. You can't leave the farm without Mark loading your trunk full of food. A look in the rearview mirror reveals Mark juggling carrots and grinning. Now, fast forward to today, here at the Save Winter, over a decade later, we're still seeking wisdom from Kristen and from Bill McKibben. Today, Essex Farm feeds over 300, and Kristen has published another amazing book, Good Husbandry, about her life and the farm, combining what she calls her three great jobs, mother, farmer, writer. And as you are about to see, we are very fortunate that she shares all three so generously and so eloquently. And you'll be able to uh, purchase those books and have them signed by Kristen uh, immediately following this talk. So please join me in welcoming Kristen Kimball. Everybody here, everybody online, out there. And uh, I, want to, um, I want to say thanks to all of you who, maybe with questionable judgment, decided to come inside today on one of the most beautiful winter days I've ever seen in the Adirondacks. Um, I'm very glad that the mountains decided to show their best to all of the visitors from around the world. Um, so let's see, what do you want to talk about today? First of all, I wanted to say thank you so much to Carlin for doing just a tremendous job organizing this amazing conference, um, and to Heather for the kind words. One thing that Heather did not say in her, her introduction <laughs> is that uh, the, the um, Youth Climate Summit that she was talking about featured Mark wearing, what was it, Mark? <laughs> She's making me revisit this part of my life. I think that I entered the stage wearing just Brussels sprouts and carrots at that conference. Right, Heather? Yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> we still get people turning up on the farm sometimes and recalling that conference. Um, it's very impressionable when you're in middle school and some adult shows up wearing skivvies and Brussels sprouts. Um, so, as I was saying, I just feel very lucky um, that I discovered this place in the world 20 years ago. Um, can I just cue you to go slide to slide? Okay, I'm going to do that. Next one, please. Um, 20 years ago, I was living very happily, if frantically, um, in New York City and working as a writer and an editor. Um, one day, I went to interview this very tall, very fast-talking, very energetic farmer, and I fell in love with him, and I fell in love with his work. And here we are 20 years later. Next slide, please. Um, still on the same farm. Um, having built a family, having gotten to know and be part of a community, um, and we have a very good life feeding people here. Um, and I want to tell you more about what we do and why we do it, um, and maybe talk a little bit about what you can do in your own communities, but first I want to welcome you to uh, imagine our world a little bit more deeply and to try to connect in your hearts and in your imaginations with um, why we love our work so much. And so I want to start with a reading from my first book, um, which tells the story of me meeting Mark and leaving the city and starting our farm together. Um, as Heather said, our audacious goal back then uh, was to be a fossil fuel-free farm and to see that if we could create a modern food system for our community that ran on the real time power of the sun. So we built our farm uh, around the idea that we could do most of our work with draft horses rather than with tractors. And the first decade of our life on the farm was very much centered on working with the horses. And that was a very joyful and beautiful thing for me and I think for all of the people who worked at the farm. So we're going to tell you the story of how we found our first team of horses. Um, their names were Sam and Silver. And I think all you need to know um, to understand this section is that I had ridden horses all my life at this, at this point, but I had never driven them, and I had never been around draft horses or other working animals. Um, and I'm going to invite Mark to read it because he's a good reader and he has more voice than I do. And um, could we go to the next slide to give you something fresh to look at? And here he is. I'll just sit and watch. Hi, everybody. It was snowing when we pulled up to the Cooper's farmhouse a low ranch on a dirt road that was overshadowed by the long red barn next to it. Jim Cooper came out to greet us in plain clothes, flat hat, and those curious Mennonite whiskers. He walked us into his barn, which was full of the biggest horses I'd ever seen, their muscular haunches protruding from the straight stalls into the central aisle, black, brown, and roan, all of them higher than my head. His son, in his early 20s, had a colt in the cross ties, a percheron, well-built and fit with a black hide that shone like a pair of new boots. He was wearing a bridle over his halter, and the lines were buckled into a bidding rig, a strap of leather that encircled his barrel. The horse mouthed the bit, jumping up and down, ears half back, not nervous, but not completely at ease. Jim's son unsnapped the cross ties and led the colt past us to the paddock where a few horses were loafing. Jim explained that this was the way he started his young horses by turning them out in a bidding rig and letting them get used to it on their own time in the comforting presence of their herd mates. Then Jim's son backed a fleshy roan mare out of one of her straight stalls, one of the straight stalls at the end of the aisle, 
and Jim brought her out. Jim brought out her mate, another mare, so well matched I had to look for ways to tell them apart. They were Belgians, eight years old, well broke, Jim said, and well mannered. But horses are horses, he said, and there's no such thing as bomb proof. He and his son went over them with brushes, lifted the collars over their heads, and settled them on their shoulders. All their movements spare and calm in that horseman's way of hurrying that keeps the horse at ease. Had a man once, he said, who wanted to get into drafts. His wife was nervous about horses, so he wanted a bomb-proof team. He pulled a heavy leather harness from its hook next to the mare's stall. I had a pair of geldings to show them, a real steady team, the kind of horses a child or a woman could drive. He hefted the hames above his head and settled them gently into the groove of the collar and laid the rest of the harness along the mare's back, where it balanced in an incomprehensible tangle while he stepped in front of the mare to buckle the hame strap. Man came out to see the team. These were good horses. He walked behind the mare and pulled the harness over her haunches, the tangle of leather falling neatly into place. He pulled her bob tail over the britchin and then buckled the belly band. I hitched him up to the wagon and we started across the road. He had a bridle by the headstall. The mare dropped her nose and he slipped the bridle over her head, buckled the throat latch and hooked the curb chain under her chin. Jim's son had the other mare harnessed and he brought her up next to her mate and they buckled the lines of the bits. I got her to the other side of the road and a bee stung one of the geldings and off they went at a run. Man got so scared he jumped off the back of the wagon, hit his head on the edge of it and, and died just like that. These were good horses, never gave me any trouble. Yep, no such thing as bomb proof. Step up, mare. The snow had stopped falling and the air had turned sharply colder. The wind picked up, maybe not unlike today. And the new snow picked up the new snow and blew it in twists across the open field. The mares seemed to take on its nervous energy and pulled at their bits. Jim stepped the near horse over the pole of a heavily built sled that was waiting in the driveway and his son snapped the neck yoke to the harnesses, placed the pole in its ring and then hooked the tug chains to the evener. Jim had the lines in his hand, and when we were all settled in the sled, he spoke to the horses and they stepped out eagerly. The driveway was icy and the mares scrabbled to keep their feet. Across the road, the field was deep in snow and the mares had to work to break a trail. Jim wooed them and they danced in place, pulling hard at their bits. Drop that mare down, he told his son, who jumped off the sled and waded to the off mare's head. He unbuckled the lines from the ring of her bit and rebuckled them halfway down the bit's arms. I knew from riding horses that this would give Jim the leverage to pressure the mare's tongue and bars between the bit and the curb chain. I looked at Jim's sturdy frame and wondered how in the world I would be able to control this much horse. We struck out again, but the mares didn't settle. Instead of a walk, they minced along at a nervous trot. They haven't been worked since fall, Jim explained. If you wanted them, I'd work them for you every day for a couple weeks, get them sharp. And then after a few more minutes of struggle, he wooed him again, exhaled and said, you don't want these horses. Go see Gary Ducat. He's got a team for sale that he brought, bought from me a few years back. They'll be what you're looking for. And they were. The team was hitched when we arrived, an eight-year-old boy neighbor of Gary's up on the wagon like a bowsprit holding the lines. It was a hard scrabble hillside farm, a few cattle lipping silage behind a single strand of high tensile wire. Gary was in the listing barn, tending to a tiny calf that was sick with pneumonia, gaunt sided and struggling for breath. He said with regret he'd have to take it behind the barn and shoot it later on. We mounted the wagon and he spoke to the horses and they set off at an easy walk. Half mile along the frozen dirt road, Gary said, you're gonna buy them, you might as well drive them. And I took the lines in my hands for the first time. It was like holding live things, a pair of tame snakes. Riding, you have your whole body, 
heels, legs, seat, weight, and hands in communication with the horse. Moreover, you're on top, a position of power. When you're driving a team, all that communication, the whole intense conversation, takes place through a few inches of leather running across your palms, your connection to the horse's mouths. And there are two of them, blind to everything but the road in front of them, and they weigh a ton each. And you are strapped to them from behind, your fates bound. <clears throat> I guess I'd imagine draft horses would be boring compared to the horses I like to ride. The hot wild type that will move off on your heel like drag racers. But I glimpsed that day how wrong I was. Sam and Silver arrived at the farm two weeks later. Mark and I had spent the week banging together a pair of straight stalls for them in the West Barn, the bitter cold sending shock waves to the elbow with every whack of the hammer. We spread a thick layer of straw in the stalls and filled the new mangers with hay. And we were ready. They stepped off the trailer like kings. That such creatures exist moves me. That they labor for us willingly and with heart is miraculous. <clears throat> they were Belgian geldings, sorrel colored with flaxen manes and tails. Their histories were murky, but they were supposed to be 14 years old, used for farm work, parades, and pulling, bought separately at auction and paired up by Jim Cooper. Silver was the looker of the two. The mass ma majority of male horses are castrated when they're young to prevent unintentional breedings and make them more tractable. Gary told us Silver had been a breeding stallion until he was past 10 years old. He still had a typical stallion's neck, thick, arched, and heavily muscled. He looked custom built for pulling heavy things with a wide chest, well-sprung ribs, and a short back. His expression was powerful and confident, if not stunningly intelligent. Sam was his opposite, angular, stringy, and wise. His action was snappier, and he carried himself like an enlisted soldier, upright and a little tense. Sam's ear flicked back when you spoke to him, and he conveyed the sense, like some horses do, that he would do his best to take care of you, even if you did something stupid. They both topped 18 hands, so tall I had to stand on a bucket to brush their backs. <clears throat> the next morning after milking, I backed Silver out of his stall and put his bridle on, climbed a stack of hay bales, and leapt onto his bare back. It was like riding a warm sofa. When he moved, it was an oceanic roll. He seemed a little bewildered, at the strange, small weight on his back, the unfamiliar feeling of legs wrapped around him, and it occurred to me that he'd probably never been ridden before. I put him back and bridled Sam, whose sharp withers were not merely as com nearly as comfortable as Silver's broad back, but Sam was eager to go. We rode out through snowdrifts to the big rise at the eastern edge of the farm. From the rise, there's a good view of the lake and the wind had blown the float frozen ground free from snow. I gave Sam a little kick, and he set off at a canter, stretching his long legs, his huge stride, eating ground. I felt a familiar joy pulse through me, the feeling horses have given me since childhood. Sam seemed willing to run for miles, but I was a little worried at that speed, that I might lose my seat on his bare back and crash. I pulled him back down to a walk, smiling. He might be a plow horse, I thought, but he's got a thoroughbred soul. Proving again that we are different species. <laughs> thank you so much for reading and thank you for um, listening, everybody. We can go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to uh, tell you that as our business grew through that next decade, our tactics shifted 
And our goal, um, which was to grow food um, for our community and do the best we could for our planet, um, our goal remained the same. Um, but we shifted from trying to reduce our fossil fuel use to trying to um, sequester more carbon in the soil and, and, um, and increase the health of our soil. Um, we did that um, and, and came up with a business model that supported that because we believed then and we believe now that agricultural diversity is the key for a healthy agro ecosystem. I know that's a lot of big kind of nerdy farm nerd words, but all I'm trying to say is that the more types of plants and animals that you have moving across your landscape in a managed way, the better and the healthier it is for your soil, for the plants, for the animals that eat the plants, for the people who eat the plants and the animals, and for the planet. Um, but diversity is a really tricky thing um, in agriculture because we live in an economic system that pushes food production further and further toward uh, ruthless efficiency. Um, it's always going to be more profitable to milk 10,000 cows than it is to milk 20 cows while also trying to raise vegetables, grow fruit, make hay, raise beef, pork, chicken, eggs, and grains. So what we did was we tried to build a model to hedge against the economic inefficiency. Um, and instead of selling products or food by the piece, we sell a whole diet year round. Our members buy in and they come to the farm every week to pick up whatever they need um, to feed themselves and their families. And we try to produce everything um, that we want and, what, the, and that what they want for an interesting and nutritious seasonal whole food diet. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. Go ahead, next one. A substantial amount of our land and labor is dedicated to vegetable production, especially during the 100 days between frost in our region. Next. Oh. I didn't realize that one moved. We can go to the next one. We milk 20 to 25 Jersey cows. Next. Um, and our cows and our, our beef cows and our milk cows are all raised on grass. Um, and I think the one thing, if you're gonna remember one thing when you leave here today or if you're listening online, um, I want you to remember that I said this because I think the world is getting an oversimplified view of animal agriculture right now, which tends to vilify animals in the agro ecosystem. And I want you to remember that it's not the cow it's the how. It's very possible to raise animals um, in an integrated food system um, that are not only not harmful to the planet, but are, are beneficial. Um, we can go to the next one now. And the next one. So sheep on our farm fill a very important niche in our, in our ecosystem because they're so modular and small and they prefer to graze different species than the modular, cattle do. I'm also modular and small. <laughs> we can go on to the next one. Um, the pigs as well, um, they're really good utilizers of extra produce, spent vegetables, whey and skim milk and things that come from our dairy. Um, and they get a really amazing amount of their nutrition from foraging when they're allowed to be on pasture. Next. This is the mobile egg production department. Um, these hens are on pasture all during uh, the grazing season. And that is Sven, the truly squishy livestock guardian dog who keeps them safe from foxes and skunks and owls and things like that. Next. Uh, one of the most important ways that we increase soil health is through the use of cover crops. So this is a field of rye and vetch, um, and those two plants add carbon and nitrogen to the soil. Um, so not only do those crops help draw down carbon out of the air and put it into the ground, 
but they increase the carrying capacity of the soil by adding nitrogen, and that sets up a very virtuous cycle whereby more carbon can be sequestered and more food produced. Next. We grow about 20 acres of vegetables in the growing season, and we keep an emphasis on storage crops like potatoes and winter squash and carrots and onions and garlic and cabbage, um, which help carry us all through the winter. Next. Um, we make hay from our grass, which is our way of storing sun energy for the use through the long winter. Next. Um, and you know, we're all just beginning to understand the wealth and complexity and richness of life underground. Um, does anybody know how many organisms there are in one tablespoon of healthy Agricultural soil, any guesses? Yeah, I know you know. <laughs> Anyone wanna take a guess? How many live organisms in one tablespoon of healthy soil? 100 million, anyone else? A billion, bingo, that's it. Um, they believe that there's about a billion living organisms in one tablespoon of soil. So think about that. Um, and you know what? a complex ecosystem like that likes. They want a very rich mix of plants that are living and dying on the surface and animals that are chomping and stomping and pooping on the surface and insects and birds and wild animals too. Um, at our farm we have seven distinct classes of livestock that are going across our farm at any given time during the grazing season in combination with probably about 60 different kinds of vegetables right, um, and herbs plus an array of cover crops and forage and woods and brush. Um, so one year a field like this will be feeding sheep and then the next year it will be growing vegetables. Um, this picture reminds me of another advantage of agricultural diversity, um, which is that working on a diversified farm is a lot more fun than working on a farm that produces one one crop, if I do say so myself. Um, instead of drudgery, we, I think, we, I think it's safe to say that we offer adventure. Agreed? Yes. Um, so, if the solution is here, if we know how to do this, and it's beautiful and it's fun and delicious, why isn't everyone farming this way? Next. And the answer is that our food system and the economic structures that surround it make it very challenging right now for diversified models to be profitable. Diversified agriculture wins for soil, it wins for people, and it wins for the planet, but it's kind of an economic wreck. You can't achieve economy of scale on a highly diversified farm. You have to have infrastructure for all of these different beautiful interlocking enterprises. You have to train your staff to be dairymen and shepherds and haymakers and vegetable growers and customer service agents. And meanwhile, the larger food system that we're in is moving closer and closer to consolidation and to ruthless efficiency. Does anybody know, you probably know this statistic, all of you, but there are four mega companies in this country that currently control the majority of the market for 80% of our food products. So this is a system that enriches the mega companies while exploiting farmers and farm workers and controlling consumer choice. And it's not only production, next please. It's food processing, distribution, and I think this is crucial, the way that food is marketed to the consumer. Next one. So that's all a big bummer, but I think there are beautiful ways and joyful ways that we can move against uh, the prevailing winds, and here's three of them. Number one is that we've long relied, and I totally believe in the drug dealer model. If we can get people to taste real whole food that has been grown well, and if they can feel what it does for their health, we can get them hooked for life. The second thing is Education. 
We need to make sure that children, especially, are exposed to home-cooked whole food at a young age so that they normalize whole food and they don't normalize processed packaged food that's ubiquitous in their world right now. I have this story about my, some visiting um, extended family who came to see us and they brought their, I think she was then four years old, a uh, little girl. And it was June, which is strawberry time on our farm, um, which my kids look forward to like, you know, second Christmas because um, the strawberries bloom, we walk down the rows and we just, you know, eat the most perfect berries along, along the path. Um, and this little kid came to visit and we took them out to see the strawberries with just like great joy and can't wait to see what this kid makes of this delicious fruit that's just spilling over her feet. And she got out there and she refused to taste them because she'd never seen a fresh strawberry growing in the ground and she didn't recognize it as food. In fact, she didn't eat anything that we had to offer her um, on that trip and her mother ended up driving her to McDonald's 40 miles north so that she would eat something. <laughs> but it drove home to me the idea that um, we're living in a world where what's normal to us is food that arrives from a factory in packages rather than food that comes from the ground and is prepared in our kitchens. And that's a really dangerous thing for the future of our food system. So the more that we can educate kids and families on how to buy and cook and eat whole food, the more secure our, our farms and our farmers will be. And the third thing I think we need is good communication. I think that we have to tell the story of sustainable agriculture. Um, and the truth is that people like Mark and people like me are never going to be as good at that type of mass communication as the mega companies are. Um, We've noticed in the last 20 years that every time we farmers come up with a word to describe what we do, organic, green, sustainable, it, it gets, it gets co-opted and it gets twisted and it gets made meaningless by big food. Um, and I haven't used the word regenerative yet because I'm saving it for the time not too far down the road when the word sustainable has been completely wrung dry of its meaning. Um, what we do have, I think what all farmers have, is the ability to be transparent and the ability be, to be authentic and to trust that people can see and taste what's good for them if we give them half a chance. You can go to the next one. And I think the most important tool we have in our toolbox is community. I think community is what keeps our farm running against the prevailing winds. I think community is the tool that we can use to get what we want collectively from our local food systems. Community is where we learn to cook and where we learn to eat and enjoy food together. And community offers authenticity, love, and satisfaction, which is really the opposite of what we're being sold in the larger food system now. Next one, please. So my second book is about the middle years of the farm. And this one begins to reckon with the difficulty that's inherent in the diversified farm model and how tricky it is to run a project that you're passionate about with your partner while raising small children. You can go on. And we haven't solved the puzzle yet. I love what we do with my whole being. I love this work. I love that we get to be outside. I love that we get to use our bodies to foster the health of living things. And it's the most rewarding and nourishing and satisfying work that I can imagine. Next. It's a big privilege to connect with other people, to connect over good food, and connect to the work that we collectively 
as civilizations have done in order to feed ourselves for the last 10,000 years. Um, we've been really lucky to do that. And it hasn't gotten easier in 20 years. I would say that these forces that I'm talking about of consolidation and industrialization are getting stronger. And sometimes we think that we might be the last generation that will be able to farm at a family scale. And I hope that's not true. I hope it's not for farmers' sake. I hope it's not for planet's sake. And I hope it's not for the sake of everyone who eats. Next one, please. So the question is, what can we all do if we agree that independent, family scale, non-industrialized farming is good for our communities, for ourselves, and for the planet? What can we do to help foster the survivability of these systems? And I'm gonna give you three things. Number one, very simple, is choose your food wisely. 1% of the American population farms, everyone eats. So consumers are the key. If you vote with your food dollars for what you want to see in the world, I promise you it'll make great change. Number two, and this one is specifically for this event here. Number two is get out there and farm. If you're an athlete or you are the family of an athlete, I got to tell you there's so many parallels between what you do and what we do. The top reasons I hear from young people who come to farm with us about why they want to do this work, which is low pay and very difficult, is number one, that they love being outdoors. And number two, they love working with their bodies. They love the satisfaction of physical work. So if you're an athlete, if you were an athlete, if you know those things make you happy, consider it. And then the third thing, is leverage your voice to influence the other pieces of this great puzzle of sustainability. We have consumers as one third of it, right? But consumers really can't do it alone. We also need legislation that supports sustainable farming, and we need philanthropy to bridge the gap between what farmers are trying to do and what's affordable. I truly believe that sustainable farming can feed the world and be profitable eventually, but we don't live in that system right now. Farmers need ways to pay for these unreimbursed costs of taking care of the planet. No matter where you live in the world, there are farmers in your area who are doing good hard work in harmony with the soil and trying to do well by the planet. It's not always easy to find those farmers because they're probably like us and very busy in the field and they don't have giant marketing departments behind them, but they're there. And if you can buy their food at the price they need to make their ends meet, I promise you, you will give them courage to put seeds in the ground for another year. Thank you. And we have time for Q&A, which I'm looking forward to because we have such a nice group here. But I'd like to invite Mark up for that. And I noticed that we have some farm members in the audience, and I was wondering if they might want to come up and also answer panel questions. If you feel so comfortable and so moved, you can also just subtly shake your head. But Would you like to? Yeah. They're, 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 they're not friends at the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Come and have a seat. All right, I'm going to turn this microphone over to Mark, because he's a really good spotter. He works well at the auction when he sees somebody bid. 
Um, All right, give me one, 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 one. We're waiting for Essex Farm. It's on sale. We're going to start at two hundred thousand dollars. So I see two hundred thousand. I see two hundred thousand out here. I do. I see two twenty-five. I see two hundred thousand. Two hundred. Do you have a question? Before the prices went up too high, I thought that I would just um, share with you some um, experiences and, and uh, my perspective. Uh, I'm a, I was diagnosed about uh, six and a half years ago as a celiac. That means I'm allergic to gluten. And uh, I can assure you that the investment in whole foods and eating proper foods that is actually clear uh, what it is and uh, how it's been uh, produced is worth it a uh, hundred times over that you're not going to um, uh, be affected. Uh, seemingly, the reason that I uh, have developed the, the celiac disease is because of the uh, processed foods that we have in our lifestyles that have caused this uh, damage to my, uh, uh, to my uh, intestine uh, lining and the fact that it can't process food in the right ways. And then coming here to the US of the prepared foods that we have uh, in, in the hotel, everything is so packed with sugar. And where it's not packed with sugar, it's packed with salt. Uh, and that, I have to say, is not the case that you find elsewhere. And uh, I'm very privileged and fortunate that my husband is a fantastic cook and he cooks everything uh, when, when we're at home because uh, otherwise probably I would be suffering much more. But um, it's fantastic to hear that you're uh, uh, also getting the right message out. And uh, I just want to reinforce the fact that it really is worth the investment in order to eat proper food, not only from the taste effect that you're, you're sharing, which is, of course, the primary pe reason, uh, but the second, well, I would say it's parallel reasons in terms of the nutritional value uh, and um, how you're nutrifying uh, uh, your, yourself. Uh, if you do it properly, you're going to avoid problems. And that's what you're doing. Congratulations and thank you. Sorry, Heather. Um, so I, I live in Potsdam, so about an hour and a half away, and have a community garden behind several houses where we have this wonderful community and delicious food. And also a CSA with the Kent Family Farms, and we shop at our local co-op. But I feel like these things are all conflicting. You know, I want to support the co-op. I want to support our farmer family and also want to grow my own food. So. Um, Anyway, I know we can, any comments on that, sort of these, yeah, conflicts. Is it possible to turn this on? It's on. It's on? It's on? Oh, lovely. Um, I think it sounds like you're kind of doing what we're asking people to do, which is to eat whole foods, whether you're producing them or buying them from, from your neighborhood co-op or the farmer, I think that's an amazing thing. I think um, what Mark and I notice is that um, oftentimes people who think that they are um, eating local or eating uh, you know, from their local food shed, they're primarily thinking about vegetables. And I think it's really key to expand what we think of as supporting farmers to include our proteins, our fats, our dairy, our, our, even our textiles in, a, in my dream world, you know, our textiles, our, our, um, our firewood, all of the things that we need to make our lives rich, healthy, and rewarding can come from our local landscape and, and support um, and encourage your, your local producers. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest test you can do is look in your refrigerator, look in your cabinets, and see how many of the things that you have in there have labels, and then challenge yourself to see how much you can reduce of, of those things. You know, how, how far can you go into stepping away from food that has been through a factory um, and toward the food that is, is being produced right outside of your doorstep? And it can be fun and delicious and a really good culinary challenge um, to learn how to, to produce um, from your local seasonal landscape in a way that's um, 
that's delicious. You, these folks have been members of the farms almost from the beginning, right? Mm, about 13 years. Yeah, and you've probably learned a lot about what it's like to eat in the North Country on a seasonal basis, right? Yes. <laughs> Do you want that? Hi, my, my wife Annie and I, my name is Rob, my wife Annie and I, uh, when we first moved to the North Country, which from Brooklyn, um, which was around 2010, um, uh, when we moved up here permanently, um, we decided that we wanted to eat locally as much as we could. Um, I won't go into the whole detail about how we got to find Mark and Kristen, uh, uh, but we did. And we stumbled upon a life-changing, it was a life-changing event, first of all, to meet Mark. I mean, anybody who meets Mark personally, one-on-one, -on -one, it is a life-changing event, as Kristen can attest. <laughs> but anybody on the planet. Uh, the two of them together are remarkable and have changed our lives tremendously. So Annie and I made the commitment uh, when we joined the farm and became members, uh, to eat as much as we could from the farm. We made the commitment to eat seasonally and like Bill McKibben to get our paper towels and from the supermarket, unfortunately, they don't make them at the farm yet. Um, and we, by and large, have succeeded in doing that. And the way we succeeded in doing that was to find the joy in eating seasonally, to find the joy in the first bite of asparagus in the spring, and then, when the, and then a month of asparagus at every meal. And, but it's, I mean, there's a true joy in discovering uh, that, that, that first taste. And what I'm talking about when I say a first taste is the first taste of an asparagus has just been picked. You know, the day before you go for pickup, or maybe at the most a couple of days before you go to pickup, that asparagus was in the field uh, a, f a day or two before you eat it. And the experience of eating vegetables that fresh it can only be experienced. It can't be, I can't tell you uh, what the difference is. You must experience it. Um, you know, the sugars, I won't go into it, but you can, you, 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 you can probably sense what I'm saying. But then you've, you, when you're finished with asparagus, you're finished with asparagus. That's it. It's not like a month from now, oh, I want an asparagus. That's done. You're not eating asparagus anymore. By the time you're finished, you really are really, you're done with asparagus. You know, and <laughs> so, and this, but lettuce, however, goes all summer right into the fall you know, unless you have too hot a summer. So it's, uh, but that first taste of lettuce, the first taste, the first taste of every vegetable, the first squash you eat, the first kale that comes out. Um, it's, there's a huge reward in having the luxury of eating seasonally, a tremendous award. And if, once you make the commitment to do it. And so we did make the commitment. Um, I'm a, a home chef, a home cook, um, so I, I kind of <laughs> dived into that and learned how to uh, process, I mean, this, this incredibly rich cornucopia of food that was coming at us every single week. And not only that, but the, my wife's, uh, the first season we realized in the dead of winter that we didn't have any food. We were eating like potatoes, onions, and cabbage, basically, and pork, um, you know, in February. And so we bought a chest freezer and started processing our own. I mean, we started storing vegetables, and you can freeze and store uh, quite a bit so that, you know, in January you can still be eating broccoli. Um, yeah. No, I was just going to. I was just going to say I'm a Brooklyn girl from Bed Stuy, and when I told my friends that we were canning and freezing, they fell off the chair in laughter, <laughs> because this was not something that I ever did. I did not grow up near farms, um, but 
the thing is that the food tastes different. When we have company from the city and people come and sit down at our table, they take a bite and you can see their eyes open. Oh my God, like this butter is unbelievable. This tastes so different. Wow, these vegetables, like where are you getting this? And you know, if you try yourself, my son lives, our son lives in LA and he wanted to grow vegetables in the backyard. He sent his soil to be tested. They said, don't eat anything that grows from this soil. You cannot do that. And so he had to get all, you know, soil like from the store. And here we have this, that's what I've learned from you is that that soil, right? This living thing that's under your feet that, you know, when you live in the city, you don't think too much about it. You're walking on pavement, you're not looking at the soil. But now I've come to understand what the soil means and how intricate it is and how wonderful it is. And that's a real gift too, thank you. I'd say one more thing um, uh, about, about, and it, it, rever it relates to the soil as well. Uh, I realized, it was a few, couple of years ago, all of a sudden I realized, I got very into the microbiome. That's like a, you know, like a, a word that everyone's been throwing around, microbiome, and taking care of your bacteria, and the, you have these like critters inside you that you need to like, you're the farmer of these critters, you gotta feed them properly, and or else they turn on you. And uh, so, uh, but I realized that after so many years of eating off of this 1,100 acres, there's a particular microbiome coming off of this soil that we are attuned to now. Our bodies are part of the farm because it's, we, we eat over 90, well over 90% of our diet is the farm, except for tinned sardines and stuff. So our microbiomes are, are part of Essex Farm. And this is one thing that terrifies me about perhaps the farm not being there for us at, at any time, that, um, that those critters will turn on me and say, what? <laughs> Uh, so, um, I mean, if anyone's interested or wants to understand, wants to know how to make a commitment to cooking uh, fresh seasonal food, uh, I am very, very good at it now. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful. I see. I have a question here. Go for it. Thanks. Uh, um, we'll tie us back to the soil as well. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the Cool Farms Healthy Park program that you are partnering with the Adirondack Council on. Sure, yeah. Um, the Essex Farm Institute was a nonprofit that Mark and I started about, what was that, 11 years ago? Mm -hmm. um, and the purpose of the nonprofit was to help train um, and educate farmers who are interested in sustainable, diversified agriculture. Um, the Essex Farm Institute is now under the umbrella of the Adirondack Council, and they're doing a beautiful job um, running it and uh, helping farms all through the Adirondack Park and in the surrounding regions who are interested in bridging that gap between doing right by the planet and the people that work for you and economic sustainability. And the Cool Farms grants um, offer support to farms who are looking to use um, climate friendly practices, but need the economic help to implement those things. Um, so I think the last one that uh, we made use of on our farm was for cover crop seed. So cover crops are crops that um, are not intended to be harvested for profit. They're intended to feed the soil. Um, and it's tricky sometimes to be able to finance um, the seed and the labor to put those things in the ground, even though we know it's the best thing that we can do for our soil. And so that grant paid for, um, I believe, seed and maybe some, uh, some of the labor for, for planting that cover crop. So it's a great program, and um, it's really helping out a lot of the, a lot of the farms in this region, um, and farms apply every year. And it's been really cool to see um, what they've done with those, with those checks. Yes. 
Go ahead. And I, I want to remind people that if you, I've already forgotten Kristen's one thing for you to remember is it's not the cow, it's the how. So if questions want to revolve around her, her most important question, make sure we, we recall that. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you, great presentation. Thank you. Um, two quick questions. One, do you have a conservation easement on your farm? And second, you mentioned legislative changes as mm -hmm. something that could be helpful to sustain the farm. Do you over, overwork that word? Uh, is it state, federal, and can you give just an idea of what type of legislation you'd be looking for that would be helpful? Sure. Um, you want to take that one, Mark? You want me to I, I, I thought I, you were I, grabbing that eagerly in a way that you Oh, I'm always respond. eager, but I like to give you some space, too, sometimes. <laughs> um, so I think we're starting to see quite a bit of change in um, the way that federal, state, and local um, government supports farming. Um, we're seeing, in, I think in the new farm bill, we're going to see a lot more support for um, climate-friendly agriculture. The vast majority of subsidies still goes to large commodity mono-cropping farms um, who are producing the calories that feed our nation, but perhaps um, in, in a form that's not the healthiest for, for our population. Um, so, you know, just getting voters and humans to talk to their legislators about how important it is for them to see their local food sheds supported in ways that are sustainable and good for the planet on a whole, that shifts the picture. I mean, the good that grants have done on our farm alone is huge. We've gotten support for rotational grazing, um, for cover cropping, for um, watering stock um, in different locations on the farm so it's easier to move them around. Um, what am I missing? Compost barn. We have a, a compost barn that was built with uh, USDA grant money, which allows us to make our own compost on the farm. Um, and the, the knock-on benefits of that, the energy efficiency of that um, is, is just huge. It's huge. Can I take the uh, development rights? Oh, yes, please do. So the first question was about conservation easements on our farm. Um, and before Mark speaks, I, there's a lot of different opinions on conservation easement, and we've seen conservation easements in our neighborhood do a ton of good. And now he's going to tell you why we don't have one. <laughs> or why we should never have one. Um, I'm looking for development easements, the opposite. Because while I think we all know that our world needs um, spaces <clears throat> that allow non-human activity to happen. I think one of the sadnesses that I see in the park that Kristen and I are starting to look at as part of Essex 4.0, Essex Farm 4.0, is how do we bring people back into the environment? Right now, people are living in cities globally. More than half of us live in cities for the first time ever. I think that happened in the last 10 years. So we're now an urban globe. And I really believe that to answer the sort of how do we make the cows work better on the soil, it's not going to be through giant farms. It's going to be through smaller, diversified farming efforts. I want each of you as an artist to start farming, and let's see who's going to do it well and who's going to do it inspirationally. And I think that means bringing people back to the land, but not with giant homes on the ridgeline, but instead ways that we can live sustainably with each other on the land. And I think that's an incredibly hard target. But what I see the park and farms like ours doing in the next 50 years is saying, seeing how we reintegrate people onto the planet instead of getting our food from South America where the soybeans are grown, or the grapes in Chile, or the rice in parts of the planet that grow rice. Let's see what it looks like when we live on the farm. So although I think there is some beauty to having conservation easements. I think there's short-term cash gains. I think it's also important to remember that we're trying to re-inhabit and live with our own consequences, and I think that involves living here now. I want to take your question in the back because I saw you next. Uh, I just want to thank both of you so much because I don't think decentralization was talked about enough, and that was uh, always been a theme of, of Bill McKibben's writings and speeches and I worry that we're actually going, we're doing a lot of great things, but I worry that on a whole that we're still centralizing our answers and we're, we've got this industrial model that got us into this mess in the first place. And um, 
I won't say decentralized energy so much because it's about farm, but I just think that um, a lot of people complain about the rising cost of food. Eggs shot up this week, and I actually think it's wonderful. And people are like, what? And I, I think everyone needs to take that attitude because I think it's very helpful to say, you know, well, the reason I say it's helpful is because eggs are supposed to be $6 a dozen. And now you can buy them from your farm down the street where I get them from my friend or meat. When meat goes up, all of a sudden my friend sells out of all of his chickens. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good to, we should talk about true cost, how things are supposed to cost. So thank you. I really appreciate that comment. And I, I think that I was speaking around decentralization, but you gave me that word just now. And I think that's an important thing to think and talk about, um, both with food production and with energy. Um, I want to say that rising cost of food and the reminder that food is precious, um, we have to remember that that bears unfairly on low income folks. And my dream for the future of food subsidy is not that we subsidize these large commodity farms that bang out calories, but they, we learn to subsidize uh, the people who don't have the means to afford the food that we produce or the, afford that, the food that other independent farms produce um, and learn to support uh, those families and be able to um, not only get, get the food their way, but also teach them the, the skills of, of cooking um, and eating together that um, make a local diet possible. So we're, we're at an hour right now, and I noticed you stood up. Is there a next event coming, or do we want to extend questions and answers for a few more minutes? If people need to leave, it's now 4 o'clock, but I wanted to just see if there was another... Can we do another five minutes of Q&A? Two more questions. Great. All right, let's do two I more questions. And I, we really haven't gotten you in the middle here, and I know there have been a couple questions. Who's got their hand up for a, a couple closing questions here? And we'll try to keep our answers brief as we wrap it up. And then again, after we're finished, you can find me and Kristen and other farmers and members for more one-on-one. -on -one. Hi, thanks so much, Kristen. Um, I was wondering, I really appreciated you bringing in the, um, at the end of your last response, the, um, like unavailability of low income folks to like access this food and how that's a huge barrier. But I was wondering if you could talk more about that aspect, but also like the other resources that it takes to eat like this, whether that's, you know, the time yeah. to travel to the farm, the, um, or, you know, the time to cook or that kind of thing. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge that like there are other cultures in the world that eat like this. Um, and have for thousands of years. And I think like we have lost that um, yeah. in an industrialized world, but um, there are other places in the world who haven't. Um, and so I just wanna acknowledge that like, this is not a new concept. Um, it's a return to something that we have known for um, thousands of years as humans. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's three barriers, right? There's the direct cost. There's the time poverty, which Again, it's just unfairly an unfair burden on people who are trying to work two jobs or three jobs and raise kids. Um, there is no doubt that even if you learn the skills to make efficient um, whole food cooking, there's no doubt that it takes longer than it does to go th through the drive-through, get a you know cheap meal for your kids, or um, to buy something in the store that you can take out of the freezer and stick in the oven. Um, and I totally see that and um, you know it can be partially mitigated by um, by teaching things like knife skills so that cutting um, an onion for example takes a minute instead of it being this sort of like insurmountable burden that looks hard when you come home from a long day's work um, but it's not a hundred percent mitigated and you know I don't think that it's fair to um, to uh, ask everyone <laughs> to you know, switch immediately to a full food, whole food, local diet. It's not feasible for some people, and I, I totally understand that. Um, there certainly have been times in my life where it would not have been feasible either. Um, and yes, I think you know, looking outside our, our um, American culture at other cultures around the world, 
looking at the connection between um, a lang landscape and a climate and a, and a cuisine, for lack of a better word, and seeing why it is that you know, a certain food is traditional in a certain climate is really, is really interesting and enjoyable. Um, and it adds to our own joy about how we eat. Um, one, one last thing, if there are local folks in here who are interested in eating from our farm, um, we have a very lovely and wonderful member who just established a fund to bridge the gap between what families can afford and what we need to make the food grow. <laughs> and we have space for a lot of new individuals and families. And it's confidential, it's simple. Um, and if you know people in the area or you're here and listening and want to eat this food but don't know if you can afford it, um, please just email us, get in touch, and we can, uh, we can make it happen. Awesome. And is there any other burning question we can wrap right there? Did anyone else have a hand up that they're like, I've had my hand, Elizabeth? I do not have a question, but I just want to um, thank Kristen and Mark and say that um, Kristen and Mark's farm is one of the farms that contributes to or um, collaborates with the Hub on the Hill in Essex, where um, they're pioneering the um, access for people holding SNAP, um, who use SNAP benefits to purchase their food to enable them to buy food from Essex Farm. Thank you so much, everybody. And um, I've got books out that way, and I think there's gonna be a raffle. Did I hear there's going to be a raffle? I think there's going to be a book raffle. Anyway, if you want a book, um, I'll be right out there to sign books and say hi. And again, thank you so much for spending this beautiful afternoon with us. Um, and thank you to everybody who organized the conference, um, and to Rob, Bob, and Annie, who did not expect to be called up today. Um, and have a great evening tonight, and enjoy the rest of the World Games. So how about another bigger round of applause for this panel? Kristen, thank you so much.